so we'll start the next part of the same topic that is related to effect of alloying elements on steel we are left with two more elements molybdenum first and the last is tungsten so we'll try to find out the effect of adding molybdenum to steel is it leave it there you all of you got your books right yes again okay, just follow the books so what is the effect of molybdenum on steel it reduces the grain size earlier we have discussed about grain size how to define and understand grain size i told you that individual if you take into consideration any of these elements they are made up of small soul small unit cells or blocks and this small unit cell or blocks we call them as lattice so this unit lattice they have got this lattice is some sort of a you know the structure could be any type of structure we will try to figure out or find out a situation where the structure is more or less like a cuboid three dimensional with atoms or molecules at each corners so the whole thing the grain the boundary that we get because of this individual unit cell is the grain boundary so the purpose of the molybdenum is to reduce this grain boundaries which increases the or the purpose is to reduce the grain size which increases its impact resistance so if you reduce the grain size then there's more grain boundary yes so if i reduce the grain size now i've got this big something with assume like one unit cell here one unit cell here one unit cell here one unit cell one unit cell one another unit cell here so like total eight assume now i am somehow manipulating the size and instead of having 8 now i am having 16 so if i am having 16 in that means i am having more number of grain boundaries now right yes or no yes so the number of grain boundaries by reducing the size the number of grain boundaries or the grain boundary is getting increased and by doing so how the impact resistance can be increased now impact means we are applying a very sudden application of load this is impact now if this structure is not able to withstand the load it will break down right now somehow if the internal structure can be manipulated in such a way that the force can be transmitted or transferred from one unit cell to another unit cell in that case it can withstand that load and there won't be any effect of impact so in order to transfer the load from one unit cell to another unit cell now assume i have got only one big unit cell nothing in it. okay only one so it has got nothing to transfer but then instead of one if i got two that means it can transfer somewhat in, in, instead of two if i am having three that means it can transfer more so by reducing the size of individual grain we are increasing the grain boundaries and by doing so indirectly we are creating a situation where this individual cell can take up the load and it won't have any effect on the impact so in other words we can say the impact resistance is getting increased okay so it increases its impact strength as well as its elastic limit quite natural the elastic limit will be increased because i have got more grain boundaries now it it can be stretched more right if something like one piece and then i have got multiple piece so you can think of like one piece one unit cell here another unit cell here being joined by some sort of a spring you can think of this as some sort of a spring so with having spring in between that means i can stretch it isn't it 
Now, if I got more number of unit cells with spring attached to it, that means I, I will have more elastic limit now. So, by having more number of unit cell, and how we are getting that? By reducing the size of this unit cell. So, by reducing the size of the grain, we are increasing the grain boundaries, and by doing so, first of all, we are increasing the impact resistance at the same time, the elastic property, elastic limit is getting increased as well. Okay? What happened? Okay. They don't understand. Wait. Uh. Uh, what I'm trying to say is this is a block. Now this block has got four additional block. Okay? So this individual block is an unit cell with atoms and molecules being arranged in certain fashion. And I'm assuming the most simple case with atoms and molecules being arranged in this specific fashion. So this one is actually it is made up of like this. <laughs> with atoms and molecules at every corner. And these are the grain boundaries. Now I am applying some load here because I have got grain boundaries here so the load can get transmitted from one unit cell to the other unit cell. And this way I can increase the impact resistance property. Okay. 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 Very good. Now you can think of this as this is one unit cell and this is another unit cell. And this unit cell are joined by some spring. So because they are being joined by some spring, so I can stretch it, isn't it? That means I am able to increase the elastic limit as well. Now if I got more number of unit cells, that means an individual in which sense I can think of as being attached by the, some sort of a spring. So if I have a multiple number of units, that means the spring action will be increased as well. So that means by doing so I can increase the elastic property as well. So by reducing the grain size and by having more number of grain boundaries, what I am able to achieve, I am able to achieve an increase in the impact resistance as well as an increase in the elastic property as well. Okay. We can also increase the wear resistant property exactly similar to carbon. By making it hard, it is also increasing the wear resistant property. Wear. So, whenever two things will be rubbing or meshing against each other, there will be wear and tear, friction, because of the friction. So, if I need to reduce this property, I need to make it hard. It also increases the fatigue resistance. It can withstand multiple load reversal condition and still it won't fail. So, by having molybdenum, we are increasing the fatigue resistance by, in, by inducing molybdenum into the best material, which in our case is iron. We are increasing the wear resistance, we are increasing the fatigue resistance, we are making it hard, we are increasing the elastic limit, and we are improving or increasing the impact resistance property as well. Okay? So you need to remember the effect of molybdenum on steel. Next we look into the chrome molybdenum alloy. It is the commonly used aluminium alloy. 
sorry, uh, ferrous alloy. SAE number, the one which is most commonly used, SAE 4130, with 1% molybdenum and 0.3% carbon. Now, you don't need to remember the carbon percentage and molybdenum percentage. You are not supposed to remember. No one is going to ask you a question on that as well. You need to remember the properties of chrome molybdenum steel. So, for better machining property, for better welding property, if I need to fuse in metal, fusing of metal means melting of metal. If I need to fuse to metal, that means I need to melt to metal. Another name for it is welding. So, to have an improved welding characteristics, we can do so with chrome molybdenum steel. Okay? It also responds well to heat treatment, heating and cooling operation. And why do we use chrome molybdenum steel? Engine mounting. Why do we use it further in the landing gear and in the engine components. So you need to remember the, the, the properties of chrome molybdenum steel. What are the properties of chrome molybdenum steel? So the most important property is it improves the machining property. That means we can cut, we can bend, we can shape. So any type of machining is done with this. Yes. No, not just to deform, you know, to give some shape, to cut, any type of thing. Yes. Can be welded easily and improves the heat treatment property. So these are the important property of chrome molybdenum steel that you are required to remember. Okay. Next is tungsten. Tungsten has very high melting point and if we fuse in tungsten to the base metal, we end up getting the alloy which can withstand very high temperature. So that means it can be used in place subjected to very high temperature at elevated temperature condition. And where we specifically use it, we specifically use it in high speed tool, uh, cutting tool. Where else we use that in magneto? Magneto is part of piston engine. You can think of magneto as, a, as an AC generator. Okay? High speed cutting tool. Wherever the, you know, you need to apply. That this, the temperature that you will be you need to operate is very high temperature in order for the tool to be cut because in normal condition you cannot cut so the, specifically in those areas we'll be using this high speed cutting uh, the, those are the high speed cutting tool. yes The next topic is managing steel. Now, a conventional steel, if I want to increase the tensile strength, if I want to make it hard, in that case, I need to increase the carbon content. But if I want to increase the hardness and as we know that in order to increase the hardness we need to increase the carbon content and by doing that we will ultimately make the steel brittle and to combat this problem, to counter this problem, to find solution of this problem, we use managing steel. Okay. In terms of the tensile strength. It is 50% stronger than the normal steel and yet they are tough, not brittle. And because they are not that brittle, we have got the hardness, 
We have got an increase in the tensile strength. That was our requirement to have an increase in the tensile strength. We managed to get it without getting the degree of brittleness, which in normal case we would have got with carbon. So because we are not using carbon and we are using the specific type of uh, steel, so we managed to increase the tensile strength by 50% compared to the normal steel. Yet it is not brittle. Okay, and because it is not brittle, so easy to machine. So, how are we getting this? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Later, you know, in the YouTube video, you listen and then clarify your doubt. <laughs> <coughs> so, how we manage to achieve this property? We are getting brittleness because of the carbon content. So, if I need to reduce this brittleness ten uh, tendency, we can achieve this by removing the entire trace of carbon. No carbon. No carbon. So, by almost total elimination of carbon and by fusing in some additional element and what are these additional elements? It could, these are nickel, cobalt and molybdenum. In such a way that they have mentioned this term called precipitation hardening. So, we will look into precipitation hardening later whenever we will be talking and discussing about the heat treatment process. As of now, you think of this as one part of heat treatment process that is uh, required in order to get the desired degree of hardness. In order to achieve this, during the cooling phase, the cooling must be done very slowly in air And we will let the steel cool by switching off the fire or the heat supply in the furnace and let it remain in the furnace and allow the air to cool it. Okay? So, what are the advantage and what are the so we have got lot of advantage but then we have got few disadvantage as well and the main disadvantage is it is expensive okay why specifically we use it for high strength high stressed application so these are this is the specific area where we use it, we cannot use it in all the places because it is expensive. We can further harden it by nitriding, by fusing in nitrogen. If I need to further harden it, I can do so by fusing in nitrogen. The process is called nitriding. We will be using cyanide, sodium cyanide and then allow the nitrogen to fuse in the base material to make it hard and this process is called nitriding. So what are the things you need to keep in mind in this particular topic regarding managing steel? What we managed to achieve? All the shortcoming that we get from a normal carbon steel we manage to get rid of those shortcomings, those disadvantage by using managing steel. In normal steel, to get the increased tensile strength, we need to add carbon. But the moment you add carbon, it tends to become hard and brittle. So in order to counter this problem, we are not using carbon 
to increase the tensile strength but instead we are removing entire trace of carbon almost total elimination of carbon and inducing in cobalt molybdenum or nickel not or sorry and nickel and by doing so we manage to get the desired tensile strength without an increase in the brittleness what is the main disadvantage it is expensive so probably if they manufacture an aircraft with this one in that case probably the ticket cost will be higher because the aircraft cost will be higher so you need to pay more any doubt so far so we'll be looking into the next topic which is about heat treatment of carbon steel so far i told you about heat treatment as you know in a very general way as a random process of heating and cooling and we do this heating and cooling in some controlled fashion in order to get the desired property that we want so so this was a, a very general way of looking at heat treatment a very layman way of of defining heat treatment so we'll try to look into heat treatment in a more detailed way okay and specifically now in this case we'll be looking heat treatment of carbon steel we can carry out heat treatment of aluminum as well we can carry out heat treatment of magnesium as well but as of now we are only concerned with the heat treatment of carbon steel so if a straight carbon steel is progressively heated progressively heated implies we are gradually heating it up not a very abrupt increase and straight means in this case you know the arrangement of the carbon a straight chain carbon but then whenever you will heat it up you will notice that at temperature 700 degree celsius even though you are applying the heat you are gradually increasing the heat but then the heat value does not get increased and there is a reduction in the heat value so this starts at 700 degree celsius so gradually you are heating it up 0 1 2 3 4 2 700 and then at 700 degree celsius you will find that there is no increase at all even though we are continuing the heating and it would start at 700 degree celsius and it would finish up you know this whole process at 1200 degree celsius and this period is known as hesitation period so what exactly is the hesitation period so microscopically at this temperature there will be a shift in the microscopic structure a change in the arrangement of the structure and the internal structure would change and because the internal structure would change so all the heat energy that you are applying is being used to change this configuration and that is why there is a decrease in the temperature because whatever heat you are applying the entire heat is not going anywhere it is being used to change the internal configuration exactly similar to like if you take ice and you heat it up the temperature does not change isn't it there is a change in the state correct from solid to liquid without any change in the temperature so there is a change in state and here also there is a change in the state and because of which you won't find any increase in the temperature and eventually again after 1200 degrees celsius the temperature would again increase 
So this you can see by, by looking at the graph and you can see here from 0 to 700 degrees Celsius there is a gradual sharp increase and from 0 to 900 it is almost constant. Not perfectly constant but almost constant. And then after 900 degree again it starts increasing. So this temperature from 900 to uh, sorry from 700 to 900 this 200 degrees Celsius is where this rearrangement takes place. So the point at which you will first notice this difference is known as the lower critical point <coughs> where this rearrangement starts happening and the point where this rearrangement stop the temperature at which this rearrangement stop the temperature is known as the upper critical point huh? yes in this case it is 900 degrees celsius so lower critical temperature in our case is 700 degree and upper critical temperature in our case is 900 degrees celsius and this period between 700 to 900 is the hesitation So this change of temperature, we are increasing the temperature without any effect on the heating value is because of the change in the internal structure, the crystalline structure of the steel. Okay. If carbon steel is heated above the upper critical point the internal structure that you get we call that as austenite so what exactly is austenite it is a solid solution of carbon in iron so iron and carbon are bonded and the structure is uniform throughout So, in other words, we can say the carbon is uniformly distributed along the iron or throughout the iron. Okay. Now, depending on the carbon content of the steel, because we have seen that we got low carbon steel, medium carbon steel and high carbon steel, isn't it? So depending on the carbon content in the steel, the internal structure could vary as well. So if steel contain more than 0.3%, so 0.1 to 0.3 is low carbon steel, isn't it? More than 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 is medium carbon steel. So if a steel contain more than 0.3% carbon and is quenched rapidly because as I mentioned to you heat treatment is heating and cooling. So now we are cooling it rapidly from above the upper critical point. Now it become hard and more the carbon present more will be the hardness. Now you see that the change in the internal structure happens at 700 degree and it stops at 900 degree. So that means until and unless we reach up to 700 degree Celsius, there won't be any change in the internal configuration. So what it's, it says that until and unless you heat something up to the critical point, there won't be any change in the internal structure. And if there is no change in the internal structure, that means it is equivalent to not carrying any heat treatment. So you can visibly notice the effect of heat treatment only when you heat something to the critical point, up to the critical point. Because it is only up to the critical point that change in the internal structure takes place. Below that, everything is It will start at lower and finish at upper. So in between you can stop. In the, if in between you can stop, in that case, the entire internal configuration won't be same throughout. Something, you know, there will be some. 
Okay? So whenever we are doing this rapid cooling, the internal structure, if we suddenly stop the, uh, uh, this operation of gradual heating and then abrupt cooling takes place, the internal structure that we get, we call that as martensite. And it is the hardest structure known while we carry out the heat treatment. So you need to remember which internal structure is the hardest structure. It is the martensite which is the hardest and because it is very hard so quite naturally it is brittle and since it is hard and brittle so you cannot do any machining if I try, try to apply some force try to deform cut whatever it breaks down so not good for machining so in order to reduce this brittleness this hardness we further need to carry out heat treatment for the heat treatment and this process is called tempering. So in order to, because we are arresting this heat treatment by abrupt cooling and we end up getting martensite and martensite is the hardest structure known and it is very brittle and we, can, we cannot use it for any machining purpose but assume a situation where I require the internal structure to be martensite because by having internal structure to be martensite I can get an increase in the tensile strength value but I do not get the softness and in order to get the softness I need to reheat it but now because I want to retain the internal structure of martensite so that means if I am hitting it I won't hit it above its critical point because the moment I reach the critical point the internal structure would change isn't it so reheating it because tempering is a process of reheating it to make it soft but retaining the internal structure so you won't change the internal structure that means whenever I am hitting it up below the critical point that's when we end up getting this tempered condition. Below yes, in this case, below 700. Okay. So, what we manage to achieve by this process, it reduces the hardness. At the same time, it increases the toughness. The actual tempering temperature used depends on the requirement of strength, hardness and toughness. Now more heat we apply, the softer it will be, isn't it? Yes or no? So, but if the amount of heat we are applying during the tempering process, if that is more, we will get soft structure. So, higher the tempering temperature, lower will be the hardness and that in place lower will be the strength. But the toughness will be greater. The maximum tensile strength of hardened carbon steel is achieved if the carbon percentage is 0.83 percentage. Now this 0.83, that three digit, that is, you know, it is not very accurate. You can generalize it and make it like, you know, 0.8 because some of the book will have 0.81, 82, 83. So 0.8 you can just think of as a perfect answer. Average answer, not perfect, average answer. So that steel which has got 0.8% carbon is called eutectoid steel. Okay? Eutectoid. Eutectoid. 
eutectoid. So you can think of this as the benchmark. And anything less than 0 0.8, we can call that as hypo eutectoid. EU. EU. T E C T O I D. So 0.8% is eutectoid. Less than 0 0.8 is hypo eutectoid. More than 0 0.8 is hypo eutectoid. So depending on whether we are referring to a situation where that the still concerned is eutectoid, hypo eutectoid or hyper eutectoid, the ultimate structure we will get will be different as well. So okay. Huh? Below or less 0 0.8? You think yes. 0.8. Less than 0.8. 0, less than 0.8 is hypo. More than 0.8 is hyper. And 0.8 is eutectoid. It is a perfect combination. If we increase more than 0.8, in that case, we end up getting a structure which is hard. But the strength will be reduced. Okay? So now, what we have studied so far, based on that, what we can summarize is, you take carbon steel, you heat it up, in the molten state, it is called austenite. Austenite. So we'll try to you know, look into what we have studied so far and what we were supposed to remember. We we'll take the carbon steel, we heat it up. The molten steel we call as austenite. And then if I am cooling it, I can end up getting different type of structure depending on the carbon percentage. And the end product will be, as I mentioned, depending on the carbon percentage. So 0.8% is the reference, which we call as eutectoid. Less than 0.8, if it is less than 0.8, it is hypo. If it is more than 0 0.8, hypo. If I'm cooling it down, depending on the carbon percentage, so we are referring this as the carbon percentage, depending on the carbon percentage, if it is hypo, we get ferrite plus cementite. This we get ferrite, and this we get ferrite plus perlite. These are the end products. <coughs> if you are gradually cooling it. Now if I abruptly cool something and arrest this cooling process in between, I end up getting a structure in between which we call as martensite. We have got different structures because we are just focused and concerned in your book. So we'll just, you know, look into whatever is appropriate for your syllabus and what you are required to know exactly as for your syllabus. Nothing more than that. We've got many other internal structures. We won't look into those internal structures. We'll look into only the internal structure where we end up getting the hardest structure. So if I arrest the cooling process somewhere in between, in that case I end up getting an internal structure which I call or which we call as martensite. And this is the hardest structure we can ever get in case of carbon steel. But because it is the hardest structure, so it is not easy to do any machining because it will break down because of the brittleness. But being the hardest, it also has very high degree of tensile strength. So if I need to retain the tensile strength property at the same time, I want to reduce 
the hardness what i need to do is again reheat it, it up but this time we need to ensure that we are not heating it above the critical point because if we heat it up above the critical point in that case the internal structure will change and it won't be any uh, there won't be any mutton side anymore so i need to heat it below the critical point in order to retain the mutton side internal structure but at the same time i need to reduce the hardness and that's all we do and this whole process is what we call as temporary this all the types of internal structures yes any doubt so far Huh? Ferrite, F E R R I T E. Ferrite and perlite, P E A R L I T E. Perlite. Ferrite and perlite, ferrite and cementite. C E M E N T I T E. Any doubt so far? Next is the quenching medium, the cooling medium. What type of cooling medium can I apply? After I heat it up, I can just let it be in that furnace and let it cool. That could be one type of cooling. Another type of cooling could be put some water. Another type of cooling <coughs> could be put some oil. Another type of cooling could be mix some salt in the water and put it. So these are the different types of cooling medium. So depending on the cooling medium, we end up getting different type of structure as well. Because different cooling medium implies the different rate of cooling, how fast we are cooling it. If we cool it something very fast, we end up getting a harder structure. If we cool it slowly, we end up getting a structure which is more soft. Okay? So, brine is the most extreme quenching medium. Brine means the water and salt that I told you. Water and salt solution. This is followed by water, then oil cooling and finally air cooling. Now, think of a situation <coughs> where I have got this part Assume this is the shape of the part, a sphere. I am heating it up. And now I need to cool it. And because I need to cool it down, so I need to, and I am thinking of putting it in some water. So I have got some water tank. And I am dipping this whole thing in water. Assume a situation. Now the moment I dip it in the water, the water comes in contact with the outer surface, isn't it? So the outer surface will try to shrink because we know with decreasing temperature things try to shrink, isn't it? The inner part is still hot, so it is still expanding, whereas the outer part is trying to shrink, so that would result in thermal stress okay so this inner po portion 
is trying to move outward, whereas the outer portion is trying to shrink. If this sort of ten tension is going on between the inner part and the outer part, so quite natural that the outer part will try to break down, isn't it? Break open. And there will be crack. So this would lead to thermal crack as well. Any doubt so far? Huh? Shrinking. Well, I've got a sphere. Now, this sphere, I heated it up and then I'm dropping it in some water tank. So, immediately the outer surface comes in contact with the water and it tries to contract. But the low temperature of the water is yet to reach the inner surface. So the inner surface of the sphere is still trying to expand. So there is this competition and fighting going on between the outer surface and the inner surface. Where the outer surface is trying to shrink and the inner surface is trying to move outward. So because of this fighting between the inner and outer surface, finally the outer surface will crack. So how do you stop that? Huh? How do you stop that from happening? We have got a lot of other ways of looking, doing this, all these things. We'll, look, we'll, we'll, we'll be discussing that. So what's the term? Thermal crack. Any doubt so far? Now one more thing we need to keep in mind. Now assume this is the water tank. And I have got a part which is this big. Okay, I've got a part which is this big and I'm trying to drip this part in the water tank. Now initially, let's say this is the part, this pen is the part and assume this pen uh, to be too big, this big probably, and I'm trying to dip it in the water tank. Now, initially, this part comes in contact with the water, isn't it? By this time, when this part comes in contact with the water, after that the water temperature has increased already, isn't it? So when this part will come in contact with water, this part, this part, this part, so successively the temperature of the water will get increased. Yes or no? At the same time, Initially, when I am dipping it in the uh, water, during this phase of time, this portion is still in air. That means it is the temperature of this portion, whenever it comes in contact with water, will be different compared to the temperature of this portion when it came in contact with water, right? Because of the delay. So that means if there is delay in dipping the part, in that case we end up getting different internal structure. The internal structure here could be different compared to the internal structure here. And it could be so different that if the delay is more, the, internal the difference in the internal structure could be such that one part could behave entirely like a different metal compared to the other part. And if that happens, one of the part, if moisture, whatever comes in contact, could behave entirely like a different metal compared to the other part, even though we are considering a simple single part. So one part could behave like an anode, other part could behave like cathode, and there could be some corrosion, internal corrosion. So if heat treatment is not done properly, it can lead to internal corrosion. If we allow more time delay, it can lead to internal corrosion. Assuming a situation where I am hitting this part at this corner of the room and the cooling medium is kept somewhere in the other room. And the moment I take this out and go to the other room to dip it, by that time the temperature of this would have decreased a lot. So we need to reduce this as well. So there is, there must be... Uh, some, some minimum distance that need to be maintained between the cooling medium and between the heating medium. 
Okay? So each of these things you need to take care of, you need to control. Any doubt so far? Any doubt so far? 